Um, yeah, so I'm Pete Warden. Um, I'm from the TensorFlow team at Google. Um, and I'm the tech lead on the mobile and embedded side. And what I'm here to talk about is how you can actually do speech recognition using TensorFlow on ARM devices. And to start off, uh, it's, I come from the image world. It's actually a lot harder to do uh, audio demos as part of these uh, slides. So uh, if you have internet connections and you have Android devices, uh, I encourage you to um, maybe very hurriedly try and type this URL and download the APK. <laughs> or download the demo from um, the uh, slides uh, that you'll see um, in the general selection uh, after we've done these talks. Um, and what you'll get there is uh, what you actually see in the, um, in this, let's see if I've got a, got a laser pointer somewhere. There we go. Um, you'll see uh, 10 words. Um, it'll ask you to say one of the words below. And some of the time, it will actually recognize what you say and light up uh, one of the words uh, there. Um, I also have this um, voice kit uh, that is a cardboard box around a Raspberry Pi uh, with a little bit of hardware um, to add uh, some microphones to the Raspberry Pi. Um, and it will actually uh, run on a Raspberry Pi as well um, using the voice kit hardware. So um, the best way to uh, understand what this is all about is to have a play with it yourself. Um, now, jumping back from that, what am I trying to do here? Like, what's the goal? Um, voice interfaces are really, really, really interesting to us for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, users actually seem to like using voice interfaces. Um, they seem to be a very natural way for people to interact with uh, devices. Um, from an engineering point of view, it's great to actually avoid having buttons and switches and displays and all of these other things that actually suck up power, take up space on the device. Um, it really means that you can shrink things down so you can build uh, devices that are almost invisible um, and allows you to create applications that wouldn't make any sense otherwise. And more than just voice inter interfaces, if you can think about anything that's listening out for noise, whether it's, hey, there's a bit of a squeaky wheel on this, uh, you know, on this uh, you know, um, mechanical device, um, to, you know, oh, I actually hear the sound of glass breaking. Um, so once you can actually do a decent job on voice recognition, it opens up the door to a whole bunch of other related applications too. And really what I want is a 50 cent chip that can do um, simple voice recognition and that will run for a year on a coin battery. Um, <laughs> now, we're not there yet. Uh, we're still quite a long way off. But I really think that this is doable with even the current technology that we have now. I don't think we're actually that far off being able to do this. And once you have something that you can you know, almost use as a disposable electronic component uh, in all sorts of consumer and toy and industrial devices, uh, I think there's, that's really going to be game changing. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that some of the work here, um, together with collaborations with the sort of people who are in this room, we can actually make that happen. So what are the big challenges to actually doing the kind of simple voice recognition that I'm talking about? Um, well, voice recognition is really hard. Traditionally, it's been something that's been confined to very large companies with very big teams um, and have very specialized stacks of language uh, models, for example. And it feels 
a lot like um, the old image processing, uh, the old image recognition computer vision world used to feel like sort of 10 years ago before deep learning came in. There's a lot of feature extraction. There's a lot of work that's um, being done uh, in very sort of proprietary algorithms. And it's very hard for somebody like me who's coming from the image world um, to actually understand what's going on. So um, to avoid um, having to deal with all of that complexity, um, I actually uh, decided to sidestep the problem uh, by focusing on a bit of a different problem instead. Um, really thinking about a lot of the applications that we care about, many of them, you're only going to say maybe 10 different words to any particular um, device, maybe 10 or 20 words that it has to recognize. So that is a very different problem than recognizing arbitrary um, open world speech. Um, yeah, if you think about lights on, lights off, um, go, stop, um, kill, uh, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> Um, it, they're going to be very, very um, sort of simple commands, but let you do a lot of things. Um, but the hidden complexity there is you have to make sure that the model knows when you're saying a word that isn't one of the commands and doesn't accidentally trigger because it sounds a bit like it. And you also need to figure out a way to let users cancel um, what they're doing fairly easily. Uh, if you are interested in the full speech recognition problem, uh, Mozilla Deep Speech are actually using um, a very full, a sort of a full stack approach to trying to solve this problem. There's also things like Caldi out there, which are great, um, but it's a lot more work than I was able to sort of wrap my head around. Um, the other thing that surprised me, coming from more of the image world, was that there are very few open data sets uh, that you can use to um, benchmark uh, how well a speech is doing. There's a lot of proprietary data sets. There's a lot of commercially licensed data sets. Um, but there's nothing that's the, really the equivalent of ImageNet or even really MNIST that you can get your hands on. Um, so I actually ended up um, having to build a data set that sort of represented the problem that I was trying to solve. Um, so we got that out uh, last month. Uh, the first release is about um, 10 hours of audio, uh, mostly as um, one second clips. Uh, so 65,000 um, utterances of about 30 different words from around 2,000 different speakers, um, and all stored as WAVs in uh, folders. Um, collected from people around the world. Um, we actually have a website where we're encouraging people to just go and record their own voices saying the words that we care about. Um, and we've released it under the Creative Commons uh, 4.0 license uh, by attribution, um, which I'm hoping will mean that other people can take it and use it and start you know, building their own models and building their own benchmarks. And we're committed to doing more and expanding this data set to get more speakers and to get a larger vocabulary. Um, I also was surprised that there were very few um, standalone examples of using neural networks to do um, speech recognition. Um, there are great projects, like I mentioned, like Caldi, um, but they almost all require a lot of pre-processing work. They have a lot of other moving pieces. Uh, it's very hard to find something that will just um, be the equivalent of an image recognition network, but for speech. Uh, so using that data set, uh, we actually put together a tutorial uh, that lets you do um, training of a simple image recognition net, uh, speech recognition network um, of 10 different words. Um, you don't have to do any data prep. You just uh, grab the uh, Python script, uh, run it. It will download the data for you. 
Um, and then you can take the model that you've trained and move it yourself over to uh, the Android demo app or the Raspberry Pi. Now, one thing that stumped me for a while was that recurrent neural networks are quite tricky to work with, um, especially for things like um, streaming audio, where you're having to um, do a lot of sequential work, and they're actually using uh, matrix times vector, um, fully connected layers, uh, which means that they're very, very um, memory bound, and it makes it hard to actually write um, optimal software, especially on very um, resource constrained devices uh, to, uh, to accelerate them. But I actually um, found that a lot of the simple keyword recognition um, models that were out there are actually using convolutional networks. They're using um, a feature generation um, approach where you basically take an FFT slices of your input audio and arrange them into spectrograms, um, images of the um, audio waveform, and then you apply networks that look a lot like very cut down image recognition networks to those spectrograms. Um, so I um, reframed the problem, and this actually seems to work quite well and enabled us to actually shrink down the models in a way we couldn't have done for RNNs. So these are the models that we actually ended up with. Um, you can see the um, first convolutional model, which is sort of the, the default easy one that I put together. Um, it actually has quite a few um, flops. It's pretty computationally intensive. Um, you know, for comparison, you know, an early inception image net network um, might be in the sort of uh, three billion range. So this is um, actually a pretty uh, beefy uh, network to run. Um, it actually isn't too large, because one of the things I really uh, worry about is how we can actually um, fit this onto embedded devices with small amounts of memory. Um, and the accuracy number is a bit um, hand wavy because it's uh, very dependent on the, uh, the data. But um, this is saying that it's actually getting 89% accuracy when you're running all of the, um, the audio samples that we have in that speech commands uh, data set. Um, now, where it starts to get a lot more interesting is um, when you go down to uh, the low latency convolution, which is a very similar network um, structure to the conv, but um, just has uh, some shortcuts taken uh, to reduce the amount of computation we're doing to reduce the size of the convolu uh, convolution filters. Um, the parameter size doesn't get much smaller, but we really we go down to a very small fraction of the number of um, compute ops needed, and we don't actually lose that much accuracy. You know, we lose like 4% here. Um, and then my colleague, who actually works on the uh, OK Google um, hot word detection team, um, implemented a, uh, a paper he'd been involved in uh, called SVDF, uh, which I couldn't tell you um, exactly what that stands for. Um, <laughs> but you should be able to follow the link in the slides. Um, he was actually able to squeeze down the flops to um, under a million um, flops for recognizing a one second clip of audio. Um, and the parameters are still somewhat large, probably a bit too large for most embedded chips. Um, but uh, you can see that he's actually able to get 85% um, accuracy um, using that model. So <laughs> what's next? We've put this together. We've got an initial um, uh, training set. We, we're hoping that really this, having a standard data set for speech recognition uh, will help 
move the state of the art forward in the way that um, uh, ImageNet and other common data sets in the image world really did. So I'm actually not very good at building audio models. <laughs> so I'm really hoping that there are people um, who will see this, who will say, oh, cool, I can do way better than those models I've seen there and actually get them open sourced and start that kind of competition that really helped um, push us forward with ImageNet. Um, anybody in this room, uh, I would love you to actually go to the speech recording site that I've got set up here um, to record your own voices, because I think it's really important uh, that we get a good range of accents and a good range of um, sort of dialects and uh, there's a big problem with speech recognition at the moment in that there are a lot of underserved um, sort of communities out there. Uh, I find myself having to do a really bad American accent if I'm trying to get my sat-nav to understand me. <laughs> um, so I can't even imagine what it's like for uh, most of the people around the world having to interact with these. Um, I am excited about improving the software. Um, we're working well on A-class chips, but uh, you can see the model sizes are still a bit too big for M-class chips. Um, can we get this running on DSPs? That's what we really need. Um, and how will this inform the hardware that's actually going to be built um, over the next few years? Can we actually make sure that this uh, hardware will work well for these kind of models? And coming back to what I really want, um, that 50 cent chip that can run on a coin battery, uh, you can add uh, you know, a simple voice interface to anything um, in your home. You can do audio recognition to uh, actually do sort of safety cutoffs. You can spot mechanical problems in all kinds of industrial machinery. Um, I love the idea of detecting kind of locusts and crickets by having a whole bunch of audio uh, sensors scattered through fields. Um, this is a whole way that we use to understand the world, and I really want our devices to be able to do the same. So um, that's my plea. A lot of you know hardware. Let's build this, and please um, get in touch. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You can drop me an email. And we're actually having a birds of a feather session at 11.15 uh, for anybody who's interested in this intersection of deep learning and hardware. So um, that's it for me. I think it might have time for questions. <laughs> <laughs>